episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. The, uh, the 711th Human Performance Wing under the United States Air Force Research Laboratory leads the development, integration, and delivery of airman-centric research, education, and consultation, enabling the U.S. Air Force to achieve responsive and effective global vigilance, global reach, and global power now and in the future. It's comprised of the United States Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine and the Airman Systems Directorate, uh, whose science and technology competencies include training, education, adaptive warfare interfaces, bioeffects, bioengineering, really fascinating set of topics. The Individualized Neural Learning System, or iNeurals, which is a topic we're going to get into today, is a fascinating augmented learning platform that will ultimately enable rapid learning by so-called closed-loop modulation of cognitive states during skill acquisition. Essentially, the Air Force Research Laboratory seeks to develop a capability that will give airmen the ability to rapidly acquire knowledge and different skills to fly through uh, via direct brain interfaces with the help of these neurotechnologies. And today, we're, we have not one, but two fascinating guests joining us on the show. Uh, to start, we have uh, Dr. Nathaniel Bridges, who serves as the Neural Interfaces Team Lead within the Air Force Research Laboratory Cognitive Neuroscience Section, uh, where he and his team seek to find and enable different ways to link the human brain and the nervous system with technology in a manner that will benefit the Air Force, uh, relying on testing and evaluating current and emerging brain computer, computer interface uh, technologies, uh, investigating the impact of various neuromodulation technologies on cognitive performance. Uh, he has his PhD in biomedical engineering from here in Philadelphia uh, at Drexel University. We're also joined by Dr. Gaurav Sharma, who is a member of the scientific and professional cadre of senior executives, senior scientist for cognitive neuroscience at the 7-Eleventh Human Performance Wing. He serves as the principal scientific authority and in independent research in the field of cognitive neuroscience, is in charge of initiating, planning, coordinating, evaluating, and conducting research and development that increases Air Force capabilities relative to critical technological areas. And his PhD is in mechanical engineering from Northeastern University in Boston. And uh, gentlemen, thank you for both taking the time to come on the show today. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Ira. Absolutely, absolutely. So be before we get into the show, um, you know, typically we we give the uh, the microphone to our guests for a little bit, just to talk a little bit about themselves. If you can both just sort of give an intro to who you are, sort of where you grew up, how you developed an interest in, in the sciences, especially these fascinating disciplines, and a little bit about your career paths to date uh, within uh, government and the military. That'd be, that'd be a really great way to start things off. Sure. I mean, hey, I guess I don't I, hear that. Yeah, so, so I can go first. Uh, so yeah, again, I, I, typically, I typically go by Nate Bridges. Um, and I'm actually a, a military child. So my dad was in the Air Force. He was an Air Force officer. And he was also an engineer. So kind of growing up in that environment, I was always inspired to, um, you know, get into the engineering field. And then particularly, I got into biomedical engineering because it seemed like an opportunity to apply a lot of engineering techniques to living systems. Um, and as I progressed through school, as well as um, I was in a program called the Student Temporary Employment or STEP program, which allowed me to do internships at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And so as I was going through my biomedical engineering um, you know, courses and spending time on base, looking at uh, kind of how accelerations affect um, you know, the brain and looking at my traumatic brain injury, I got really, really interested in um, just the brain and, and, you know, learning. And, um, you know, I saw that sort of as a, a new frontier, you know, like we, it's really what makes a lot of who we are as human beings. And it's fascinating how our brain can, can adapt and, and learn, um, you know, to, to new environments. And even when you have an injury, how the brain can change. And so as I spent my time doing internships on base and becoming more interested in the brain, um, you know, I had an opportunity to work with Dr. Andy McKinley, who's still at the Air Force Research Lab um, doing a lot of neuro neuromodulation research, which is actually a big component of the iNeural LS uh, capability and like on different neuromodulation techniques, which is a big component of our iNeural LS effort that we'll be talking about today. Um, and that really exposed me, one, to 
this the side of human performance, you know, and obviously we were part of the 7-Eleven human performance wing, um, but it was actually really interesting because here at the Air Force Research, Research Lab, we have an opportunity to focus on a lot of problems that others do not. Um, you know, obviously cl addressing clinical issues are incredibly important. Um, we, you know, get to focus on, you know, how do we find ways to help our airmen perform better? Um, and a lot of times that moves outside the Air Force and affects, uh, you know, society in, in general. So an opportunity to see that um, as well as be exposed to different neuroimaging technologies, like, um, you know, you have your MRI technologies and, um, you know, you have your technologies that allow you to look at blood flow. And, and so, so that kind of world, um, as well as just getting a little bit deeper into science and what it means to be a scientist. And so, you know, that basically uh, garnered a, an interest in wanting to be a, a science leader and to, you know, um, you know, um, help bring efforts forward like we were talking about today. And that's what led me to get my PhD. Um, and particularly, it's more was a neural engineering focus. And I had wanted to, to really get into the weeds of what's going on in the brain and, and do, um, you know, uh, you know, research where you get to look at individual neurons and in brain machine interfaces and understand, um, you know, how, 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 what's the learning process? So going back to that learning that I was talking about before, what, what's the learning process behind using a brain machine interface and how does that change the brain? Um, and so now you fast forward to now, it's been about three years since that time. And now I'm just kind of combining all of those different things, you know, so, you know, I, I started talking about just a general interest in the brain and, and you know, the different changes that occur in learning and then neuromodulation and um, how that affects the brain, and then really getting into the weeds of um, brain machine interfaces and, and um, learning. Um, and so this iNeural LS effort is taking combinations of all those different things, it, you know, interfacing human with technology, um, which I believe is the future. You know, uh, I like to talk a lot about how we use cell phones. They're, they're, we're all, they're already part of our, like our third limb. Um, and I, I think, uh, it, you know, finding ways to, to link our nervous system, including the brain, to these technologies is, is a way forward. And, and hopefully we can talk a little bit more about the iNeural LS effort. But uh, again, I appreciate the time. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Sharma? Hi, yes. Yeah, um, my name is Gaurav Sharma. Um, I have a background in engineering. Um, I'm also very new to to AFRL um, joined back in April um, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so that was very interesting. I have in fact not met anyone in my team in person uh, since then, but I've met Nate and Andy and others in the group um, as part of my previous program. So yeah, my background is in mechanical engineering. I did my undergraduate in India, uh, where in my junior year, I developed an interest in robotics and mechatronics and uh, decided to to come to the US um, to pursue um, an advanced degree in that field, went to the professor at Rutgers University where I did my MS and, you know, and, and asked him that, you know, I would like to work with you. And he said that, you know, I don't have any funding for robotics, but how about bio nano robotics? And uh, I didn't know what it meant, but it sounded so cool coming from his mouth that I said, yes. Um, Little did I know that from mechanical engineering, I was going more towards biology, things that I have not studied since my high school. But it was so fascinating to, to learn about this intersection between um, engineering and biology and how we can use engineering principles to not only engineer biological systems, but also to study them. And so that led me to this path of bioengineering. I still have a PhD in mechanical engineering because back in the day, there were not many universities offering biomedical engineering or bioengineering, but I like to think of myself as a biomedical engineer. Um, so I did my PhD in, in um, uh, moved to, to, to Boston, to Northeastern University with my advisor, um, finished my PhD. Uh, my, uh, my research, my PhD research was um, funded uh, primarily by NASA and NSF, who at that time were investing in these newer technologies and, and bio nano robots, machines that can do work at the nano scale and can manipulate at the nano scale. Um, so yeah, so, um, uh, uh, 
a fantastic research, fascinating, eye-opening, a, a steep learning curve for me, you know, coming from a mechanical engineering background, uh, but really opened my, my, uh, my world to this interdisciplinary research field that I found to be my calling. And um, so once I finished my PhD, I packed my bags um, and moved um, across the country to, to San Diego to do my postdoc. Uh, and the goal and the motivation behind that was, yes, bio robots were good. We were one of the pioneering labs, I would say, in that field. Um, but I wanted to do something more hands-on, things that I can see uh, and things that are more meaningful now and not like 10, 20 years from now, which is what NASA and NSF were asking us to do at that time. So joined this Cancer Research Institute in San Diego. I get, I think I was the first engineer they ever hired there um, to, to lead a project on how can we use tools from nanotechnology for treating conditions, cancer, atherosclerosis, how can we target these cancer cells? How can we more effectively and in a targeted fashion deliver drugs to the target site? Um, so started a couple of projects um, and um, my main project there was, can we use tools from engineering and uh, nanotechnology to develop uh, a therapeutic strategy against cancer, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and, and nanomedicine was an upcoming field at that time. Um, tremendous amount of research was being done in the community on the, using tools from nanotechnology again for delivering drug, targeted delivery. I took a different approach at that time. Uh, and my goal was, you know, how can we, how can we target the tumor and how can we develop an, um, a different strategy uh, by instead of killing or targeting the tumor cell, can we re-engineer the tumor microenvironment and uh, add a adjuvant therapy almost. Um, so my, my focus was, can we target the tumor associated macrophages? So these macrophages, again, very quickly, um, they go in the tumor site, uh, to kill the tumor cells from a very high level, but the tumor cells, they actually reprogram the macrophages that instead of killing them, they actually start supporting uh, the tumor cells by supplying oxygen and blood to them. So my goal was, can we use nanoparticles to target these tumor cells, maybe kill them uh, or eliminate them, or even better, can we reprogram them back to their M1 phenotype, phenotype where they can become anti-tumor? So use um, uh, different strategies. I change the shape of nanoparticles and show that, you know, just the shape of the nanoparticle has a profound effect on how macrophages interact with them. Uh, nanoparticles that are of the shape of prolate ellipsoid or, 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 or football are very difficult by the, for the macrophages to internalize. Whereas um, uh, nanoparticles that are oblate ellipsoid or like m and candies, they are gobbled up much faster. So very interesting uh, results there, right? So you can start thinking about how can we use this newfound knowledge when we want to target macrophages or avoid macrophages, which was very important at that time or still for macrophage mediated therapies because macrophages are everywhere in the body. You want to target just macrophages in the tumor, you still need to avoid all the other macrophages. So, um, so that was very interesting work. Again, coming back from engineering background, have never done even cell culture by the end of my postdoc, I was doing in vivo experiments, injecting nanoparticles in, in mice, in, in rodents. Um, again, fascinating um, uh, learning curve for me. Um, and so when, once I finished my postdoc, um, packed my bags again, moved to, to Ohio, um, joined um, a nonprofit R&D organization named Battelle with the focus of doing more um, nanotechnology, more bioengineering, more drug delivery, but this time the focus on the brain. How can we deliver drugs to the brain? How can we bypass the biggest barrier of them all, the blood brain barrier? Um, and one of, one of my first projects was actually funded by, by DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, um, uh, who were at the time looking for new method of delivering nerve agent countermeasure to the brain. Mm. So I proposed some nanoparticle mediated strategies again to re-engineer or to engineer the blood brain barrier to more effectively deliver nerve agent countermeasure to the brain. So that was my initiation into the, into the brain field, into the uh, neuroscience field. Again, I had, had no idea what neuroscience was or neurotechnology at that time. 
um but again um, i'm i'm driven by learning and uh, and and the uh, knowledge for seeking you know the unknown and so started down that path it was also around the same time when batel was very um interested in um, in launching a program in neurotechnology you know recognizing neurotechnology as a field you know upcoming field with room for innovation um in room for contribution and um, so we we started this uh, internally funded program called neurolife um, at batel um mm-hmm. and i was one of the four founding members of that program and the goal was can we develop a neurotechnology solution that can help an individual with paralysis regain control of his own hand so that was a project that we launched back in 2013 uh, in collaboration with the ohio state university and we developed a technology that we called a uh, neural bypass technology basically linking the brain directly to the hand uh, and bypassing the injury of the spinal cord so our first patient his name is ian burkhart a very well known a young man uh, he got injured um by a freak diving accident when he was 19 that left him completely paralyzed chest down um, due to this um, um, cervical spinal cord injury uh, so he agreed to participate in our study and so he was our first participant we we implanted a chip in his brain in his motor cortex um, that was recording his brain activity as he was thinking about moving his hand and then we used sophisticated machine learning and ai algorithms to decode what he was thinking about you know like is he thinking about opening his hand or closing his hand or flexing his fingers and so once we decoded his intent then we developed a completely non invasive sleeve that is worn on the forearm at a 260 electrode and can stimulate the muscles um in a very precise fashion to give him the function back so a brain computer interface ai and machine learning to decode his activity and a non invasive functional electrical stimulation sleeve to enable that hand movement and so using that technology we were able to bypass his spinal cord injury and he was able to use that technology to to grab everyday object um large small heavy um light but also he was able to get a level of dexterity he was able to play a guitar hero video game for example um so that was really um, a ground breaking research that came out um Uh, we published our first paper in um, in nature uh, in 2016 so going from from a team an organization very very with very little background in neurotechnology to publishing a paper in in a journal like nature um was uh w- we felt very happy and uh, you know a proud of our achievement at that time and so that paper was um was the second highest cited paper of that year right after the gravitational wave paper so very impactful study really opened the field and put put a lot of emphasis on that yes we should be doing this research or a research like that to help these individuals who really have no other hope uh, but for a technology like that that they can start to think of living a near normal life right start using their hand and regain some independence um so that was back in 2016 and then i became the pi of that program and and and, and led the expansion of the neuro life program from just developing an assistive technology for people with spinal cord injury to thinking about okay so who else can this technology help right can we develop a version of this technology for people with stroke um who may not need a chip in their brain but might still benefit from a, a wearable functional electrical stimulation system to regain their function back mm. so delved into assistive or the rehab or a restorative technology and the third bucket was enhance can we use neurotechnology to go beyond the body's natural uh, capabilities and enhance performance and that's where afrl and um, war fighter performance comes in and that area also gave me an opportunity to combined my background in nanotechnology with neurotechnology i had not forgotten the the nanotechnology um field i was still fascinated by that so went to darpa um alamondi whom you know very well and he was launching the nq program at that time and we proposed uh, developing a nanoparticle based brain computer interface that can be injected um in your in your vein or can be inhaled and can be magnetically guided to the 
to the brain and start acting as a nanotransducer. So that program was funded. I was the principal investigator of that program. And it was through that NQ program that I met folks at AFRL, Andy mm. McKinley, Nate Bridges. Um, I've known about their work. I've always been impressed by that research being done at AFRL. So I uh, went to them, uh, proposed a collaboration. So they were my partners um, on the NQ program. And uh, so that program uh, is still going successfully, but when this opportunity at AFRL came, came along to lead and shape the future of neuroscience for the Air Force, it was um, a very easy decision for me to, to make the move, uh, knowing the capabilities at, at the Air Force, knowing the people here. And so here I am, six months into this program, um, got the opportunity to help Nate uh, shape the iNeural program in the very early phases uh, now when we were developing it. And uh, now we are doing bigger and better things. Uh, we are expanding our program, uh, recruiting new folks, um, starting new lines of effort, but also uh, very excited about uh, making partnerships, developing mm -hmm. new partnerships, not just within AFRL across direct trade, but also external with academia, with industry. We want to go with them. We want to leverage what they are doing. Um, and so, I mean, I'm sure Nate will mention, we have a number of uh, partners on our iNoodles program, which is the first step in that direction to, to put uh, neurotechnology upfront on our roadmap and, and be the leader in that field. Wonderful, wonderful. Really appreciate that, those backgrounds. And it's, uh, I'm always fascinating by the paths that, that people take and where, where they start and where, and where they end up. And it's really uh, both, both of you fascinating uh, stuff to date. Um, before we get into the, the details of, of iNeurals, I was wondering, you know, we, we have this sort of this, um, this base theme here of, of neuromodulation. And it's something that, uh, interesting, we've, we've touched on briefly on some previous episodes in terms of, uh, say, deep brain stimulation for uh, Parkinson's disease. We've also done a few episodes, uh, kind of interestingly connected to your, uh, your cancer work, Dr. Sharma, on, on so-called electroceuticals, on how, you know, we, we may not need a chemical agent, but an electrical stimulation that may be able to reprogram a cancer cell or, or so forth. Could you... Um, Give us a little bit just of the, not a lecture on neuromodulation, but just a little bit of the background of similar neuromodulation technologies for, for something like what you're doing in iNeurals, where it's not, you know, uh, you're not looking at a specific um, neurotransmitter or, or target per se, but really this complex uh, learning process, which seems, my baby, I have no neurology background, but seems to involve potentially you know, hundreds of different targets in the brain. Can you just talk generally about neuromodulation in this context? Sure, you want me to take that, Garb? Sure, go ahead. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, so at the A4L, there's actually been a lot of work looking at uh, uh, neuromodulation technique called transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS, um, and that involves the, you know, you place uh, electrodes on, on the scalp and it involves in the injection of very mild um, current into the brain, say about one to two milliamps. Um, and that can be used depending on polarity to, to change, you know, the probability of your neurons firing or action potentials. Um, and in general, you might use these technologies and pair those with uh, you know, other cognitive tasks or, or cognitive environments and facilitate some of the natural um, brain processes that are, that are ongoing in the brain. Um, and so with this, you know, that's just one technology. They, they kind of array um, between, uh, you know, technologies that are providing more global changes so they're not as targeted versus those that are more targeted. Um, and so um, TDCS might, uh, depends on the tech, you know, there's different forms of TDCS. So they, there's been work looking at uh, more focal versions of TDCS. Um, but then you have other um, types of brain stimulation, like say transcranial magnetic stimulation, where you might send in varying magnetic fields into the brain and induce current at particular um, sites in the brain. And with those, you can be a little bit more targeted. Um, you know, and, and so th there's like a range between those types of technologies. Um, there's also um, sort of portability, you know, so the more complex the technology is, sometimes it, it's harder to, to have something that you can wear 
Um, and, and there's been a lot of advancements uh, making those more, more wearable. Um, but yeah, so there's PCS, um, and, and in general, you're using different forms of directed energy. So it's, I mean, I mentioned current and um, using varying magnetic fields, but then there's also, you can use acoustical forms of energy um, to send it into the brain. But in, in general, uh, yeah, you're using different forms of directed energy um, and, and either you're gonna have a more global effect on the brain and, and the idea is to sort of um, modulate some of the, the underlying neural processes to facilitate something that you care about. So it could be learning, it could be related to attention or arousal or um, fatigue, um, or on the other end, you have more focused type stimulation. So if there's a, a particular brain site that you're interested in that's related in, again, like a cognitive process, then you can uh, stimulate those areas. Wonderful, wonderful. I appreciate that. So moving towards uh, iNeurals, uh, obviously there's <laughs> it's a fascinating program. Um, I wonder if we could start out, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of look at the, um, some of the, the questions about dual use and, 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 and health and, and so forth. Could you just take us on a little walk through the background of it? Um, some of the, uh, I, I guess, you know, how, how it was implemented, how you, you know, sold it in, in house. Uh, and, and what are some of the sort of the initial uh, things you're looking to impact? Obviously, you know, there's the recent PR on, um, uh, fly, you know, flying airplanes and, and, and decreasing the time it takes to do that. Um, maybe, be, you know, obviously, thing from the Air Force, but it could this I, I, is this being looked at to leverage uh, for things like a submarine one day, a space shuttle? You know, what are some of the sort of the scope of, of this particular form uh, of learning in terms of these um, tasks, these military related tasks? Sure. So, I, I mean, I could take that too. Uh, so so you, there's two parts to your question. First was just uh, general description of binaural LS, sure. and then applications. Is that that right? Perfect. Yeah. If we can, if we can keep sort of the 7-Eleventh Air Force Research Lab, they, all those applications first, and then we'll go into other stuff after that. Right. Um, yeah. So at a high level, when we talk about binaural LS, it's really about the capability of enabling technology to adapt to an individual using their brain signals, um, you know, individual brain signals. Yeah. And a lot of times we like to refer to the Matrix, the movie. Um, you know, I know a lot of people have seen that movie, but you have Neo um, and there's some iconic scenes in there where he has this implant at the back of his head, sure. uh, which we can call a brain machine interface or a brain computer interface. And in like a matter of hours, he downloads decades of oh, martial arts knowledge uh, are you still there? I'm here. Okay. He downloads decades of martial arts knowledge um, in that, that short period of time. And then you see him, his eyes pop open, right? And there's that iconic scene where he says, I know Kung Fu. And right. there's this epic battle between him and Morpheus in this extended reality or XR environment. Um, and so that was obviously science fiction. But uh, we believe with the advancements of neurotechnology that uh, we're actually a lot closer to, them, to that than people think. And it's kind of the spirit of the iNeural LS effort, right? Because if you could pick up just a piece of that, you could imagine what you could do, right? Like you'd have super adaptable airmen, um, you know, you could reduce training time significantly because now you can acquire skills on the fly um, more rapidly. Um, and so the iNeural LS effort, um, essentially you can break it up into uh, like an, a sense assess and augment framework. So from the sense side, you know, we want to extract information from the brain. Um, and so for this effort, we're combining, um, you know, EEG and magnetic sensing technologies to non-invasively extract brain signals in real time. Um, and that's important because the amount of uh, brain signal information you can extract from your brain um, kind of gives you the, the uh, sort of capabilities, you know, like you're limited by basically how much information you can extract from the brain. So you're sensing, so extracting information from the brain using this non-invasive brain machine interface. And then you pass that through um, advanced algorithms like, you know, machine learning algorithms. And this is the assess part. So you sense, then you do something about that information. And um, in this case, these algorithms determine um, a, per a person's brain learning state. 
And then once you have that information, now that's incredibly powerful because then you can use technology um, intelligently for each individual. So based off of a uh, person's brain learning state, you could decide when, say, you want to deliver neuromodulation, um, which we've shown can be used to enhance cognitive performance for several years now um, here with our airmen. And or you could change the person's environment and capitalize or leverage, uh, you know, these extended reality environments um, like virtual reality or augment, augmented reality, which are more immersive, um, and change and customize the information that's delivered to that person for that person based off of their brain signals, all together um, to enable a person to acquire information or learn more quickly. Um, and so you have your sense, again, extracting information from the brain, assess, doing something about that intelligently with, with um, machine learning algorithms, and then doing something with that information, which is the augment. Um, and so you can imagine for yourself, say right now, um, you're like, oh man, this, this mate person, uh, I, you know, I'm not really following what he's saying. Um, we, could use, we could determine, you know, your brain state is not where, um, is not, you know, optimal. And so we can use neuromodulation um, based off of your brain and get your brain back where it needs to be um, and into an optimal state to acquire information. And then maybe your brain now is in an optimal state, then we can change the environment for you um, to facilitate your learning. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the idea behind Ironola LS is um, this system, it, it's getting beyond a, a, a one case or one shoot fits all approach um, and finding ways to better link the human being with technology. And especially when we talk about learning, obviously the brain is a huge component of that. And so we are finding ways to provide a, a more of a window into that brain for each person and, and linking that to technology. Um, so yeah, that's iNeuroLS, and in terms of applications, as you might imagine, um, this really affects um, pretty much any career field where learning and particularly being able to acquire knowledge quickly is really important. Um, and so you had mentioned before, uh, you know, obviously we we have a use case that's focused on uh, uh, accelerating or, or training when it comes to acquiring flight skills or sensory motor learning. Um, and, and, and so right now, that, that's one, again, it's a use case to show that we can enable a pilot to learn certain flight skills in a, a virtual reality environment uh, much faster than they would without this technology. Um, but you can imagine this can be extended to other domains in the Air Force. Uh, so there's like the medical and maintenance communities. Um, so envision the future, maybe we can connect this to something like an augmented reality headset, like a HoloLens, um, that would enable a person to, to you know, learn skills with hands-free um, you know, control. So they're, they're using their hands um, and you could have visualizations displayed over their eyes and they, those could change for that person as they, they learn that particular skill. Um, we also see this potentially being used uh, for like Space Force type applications. Mm. You can imagine uh, obviously, we can't send everyone to space right away, um, and so you can take advantage of these virtual reality and extended reality technologies, again, with these more immersive environments, and, and provide um, some training applications um, here on the ground while, again, incorporating the brain. And so those are some, some high-level applications. Important, it's important, Nate, about the Space Force. Uh, one thing which is important to mention, I don't know if Ira knows about it, but that AFRL will be supporting both the Air Force, as well as the newly established uh, Space Force. Okay. So, you know, we call it one lab, two services. And a brand new service, you can imagine the, the need and the requirement for training new personnel, um, you know, and, and training them quickly. So we believe that, you know, once we have a technology like this, and this, this is really a platform that we are developing. The pilot training is a, is a use case of this technology. Really, once we have a better way to map the brain, the cognitive function, once we have a better way to modulate the brain function and better AI and machine learning algorithms to put them together in a closed loop fashion, these can be applied, a technology like this can be applied to many, many different use cases. And we believe that Space Force will find um, a use, immediate use uh, for a technology like that to, to train their new, new personnel. And also beyond that, if I can just quickly add, Please. yes, training and learning is important, 
uh, and it is also urgent. You know, the, the main motivation behind iNoodles came because of an urgent requirement that, you know, in the United States military and in particular with the Air Force, we are falling way behind on uh, the operational need and the trained personnel, the warfighter that we have. Right. So there is a big gap. And, and I can give you a couple of examples. In, in, in 17, uh, there was a report um, that came out and um, uh, the conclusion was that there is a, a 27 percent difference between in the U U.S. Air Force between the, um, the number of sanctioned or funded position for the fighter pilot and the number of trained fighter pilots. Uh, and more importantly, they, they found out that it's the training and learning that is the reason for this shortage and not attrition and people leaving, right? So, so and so that was one example, that's for fighter pilot. The another example was for um, uh, people who are trained for ISR mission, right? The intelligence um, uh, and reconnaissance and surveillance uh, operation, right? Um, over the last 10 years or so, the number of ISR missions have increased by 1200%, I believe, whereas mm -hmm. the number of trained personnel, the ISR uh, analysts have only increased by 33%. So huge gap between the operational demand and the number of trained people. So the military realized that, that, that we need to invest in newer technology to overcome this deficit and have um, a critical mass of uh, trained uh, people ready for these missions. And they are investing in technologies um, and there are a number of technologies, you know, by the use of where they are using augmented reality and virtual reality, like Nate mentioned, uh, really adapting the training content to, to the individual. Uh, with the goal of advancing uh, and improving um, the learning and reducing the training time. But a number of these approaches um, are not exploiting the, the, one of the biggest component of learning, which is the brain. Mm. How can we take account of in the, each individual's learning capability and develop a technology around that cognitive ability and be able to also modulate that with the goal of not just reducing the training time, but also improving the efficiency of learning. Mm. So that was the, the big picture goal of why we embarked on this mission for iNeuros, right? To meet a critical need that exists now, but at the same time, develop a platform of technologies that have applications beyond just pilot training and can um, fulfill many of the needs that are in the community. And the last thing to add there is, beyond training and beyond tra uh, learning, if you look at the future, right, how the war will be fought in the future, General Goldfin of uh, the Air Force made a statement a couple of years back, I guess he said that uh, something along the lines of that the future wars will not be the war of attrition, it will mm -hmm. be a war of cognition, uh, okay. which is so true. Think about what's happening in the world right now. Um, we are talking about multi-domain, joint all domain um, uh, missions, right? And command and control mission. We are talking about uh, autonomy, autonomous robots, and um, the, uh, that, uh, they, that they will be playing a critical role. Someone will be controlling them, right? Mm -hmm. But there will be a huge demand, a cognitive demand on the war fighters in this fog of war, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a very, very different environment. So how do we use, can we use, the question is, can we use this neurotechnology to improve the cognitive resiliency of these war fighters so that they can, you know, uh, maintain an optimal performance in the fog of war and, and be able to come out on the top. And so we believe that the elements of this I neural beyond training and, and learning can be applied to, to, you know, improve cognitive resiliency, for example, or to improve performance just beyond uh, learning and training. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, but, but continuing along that theme, um, and sort of, you know, because we get into, when you talk about cognitive enhancement, we talk uh, occasionally on the show about, uh, uh, you know, biohacking and things of this nature. Uh, obviously, that takes us uh, down the path of, of other 
uh, interesting, what we'll call these dual use uh, synergistic applications. And, and I come out of the sort of the, the pharmaceutical industry. So I think of things like uh, dementia, um, amnesia, uh, maybe mental retardation. What is the sort of the scope of possibilities here when we get into some of these, um, what I'll call them, where the, the bio, biotechnological, bioengineering front on sort of the civilian side and what potentially are some of the things you envision for, uh, you, you know, thinking about the, uh, the health uh, and sort of health uh, maintenance and health enhancement, mental yeah. health enhancement uh, moving forward. No, absolutely. As, as you can imagine, a lot of the neurotechnology um, that we are using now in the, in the military, they have their origins in the medical community. Right, whether it's neuromodulation, a pioneering approach towards deep brain stimulation, right, mm -hmm. uh, or the EEG technologies that were developed early on uh, for mapping the brain for many, many um, um, different uh, medical conditions. So the, the the origin was in the clinical space, and now we are trying to build upon that knowledge and adapt those technology for for a military application, but. You know, you can imagine once we develop these technologies, whether it's a better way to read the brain, um, you know, using a hybrid MEG EEG device that we are trying to do with iNeuro, or a better way to stimulate the brain, right? Do we really need a large magnet to stimulate the brain or can we do it through your ear using an earbud-like device? Mm -hmm. um, which is again, one of the uh, goals for the iNeuro program. And also, how can AI and machine learning play a role in this? Can we have a closed loop system uh, for which uh, uh, we, we don't need regular intervention from an external uh, you know, physician in the medical case right, or, or an operator here? Can we have a closed loop system? So the goal is, you know, if we develop these technologies, I see, you know, again, coming back, you know, coming from the clinical field that I was uh, doing research in before I joined AFRL, I see that the medical community, the clinical community is going to benefit immensely from whatever advancement we made on eye neural, right? A better way of stimulating the brain with fewer side effects, a more wearable technology, small form factor that you can use for longer periods of time. Again, uh, or developing, you know, wearable technologies which doesn't require a surgery or a better way to understand the brain, which can give us a better way, you know, uh, or more efficient, uh, you know, uh, information on what's going on, what's the, what's the, you know, um, what, what are the changes in the connectivity or what is it that, that making a person do whatever they are doing, you know, so a, a window into the brain uh, using these advanced tools that we are developing can definitely have an application in the clinical space. Fascinating. Um, you know, and, and I apologize for this question ahead of time if, if it's uh, childish, but uh, thinking back on sort of, you know, there's the stuff in my life that uh, I learned in, in school, uh, calculus, albeit not very well. And, and then there's all the stuff that I uh, know, <laughs> but I never learned it. So uh, the lyrics to 250 songs that I've heard throughout my lifetime, I never memorized the lyrics, but I know them. Um, are there, I don't know how to phrase this, and, and, and you might want to take this one from me, but are there ways that these technologies ultimately can um, basically allow me to learn something without, let's say, the effort <laughs> behind? I mean, not that I, uh, I didn't memorize the lyrics to these songs, but they just somehow flowed into my mind over the last 50 years. Um, I, 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 I don't know exactly what I should be asking here, but maybe if we can translate this, are there different ways that we learn, let's say, uh, you know, in, in the classroom versus just, you know, background, like music in the sense that uh, maybe change the way that different things are um, in, like enhanced uh, via these technologies? I guess I'll say this again, not an expert in neuroscience by any means, but I think we will all relate to this, um, uh, feeling that in a given day or a given week, we all, we know that there is a time in a day when we are at our optimal, right? That, yes, right. give me something and I can do it. And then there are times in the day when nothing seems to be working. I can't even respond to an email uh, in a coherent fashion, right? right. What, what it tells me is 
is that there are these optimal brain states that uh, we okay. are in and out sometimes you know we go in and out um and, and we know that right and and we are when we are in that state we are ready to take on new challenges or new learn new things and when we are not in that whether we are fatigued or we don't have we have our attention is spread across we just can't seem to do anything so you can imagine that if there is a technology using which we can predict when you are in that optimal state and or when you are not right so that's number one right can we find when we are in that optimal state and if we are can we give you the the thing that you want to learn because we know you will be able to grasp it quickly and and internalize it and maybe even to even retain it longer so yes so the the answer to that question is yes if we are able to map the brain uh, mm -hmm. better and tease out these optimal versus non optimal learning state then you can imagine that yes uh, you know uh, once we know that we are in that state give me give me right uh, uh, for some people it's coffee in the morning right i need a cup of coffee before i can do anything right can it be a neuromodulatory boost that i need a little vagal nerve stimulation in my ear now throw me what you can and i will be able to tackle that so in principle that's what we are trying to do uh, in the i neuros program find out the the optimal versus non optimal learning state and when someone is not in the optimal give this neuromodulatory boost to get them to the optimal learning state and from there you can start delivering the content maybe increase the complexity of the content maybe increase the speed by which it is delivered with the end goal of you know uh, expediting learning need do you want to yeah, add anything then just yeah just to add i think there's that's an ongoing research question in, in the scientific community and you, you really need um, technologies like what we're proposing that allow you to um, pair up what's going on in the brain with your task environment and particularly moving outside of the lab and more into uh, real world type scenarios um, to, to kind of figure out what, what are the differences between um, individuals and, and, and how they learn so I think you know kind of what we're doing is is taking steps towards that as well because it's creating a a capability to to better answer those types of questions um you know as we move outside of the lab to the more real world interesting what um I'm, I'm very the other thing i i i typically on the show um sort of looking out uh you know i, I give the background of the the guests to my children. I've got three of them here, and I, and obviously the, the questions, uh, I, I, pretty much the same questions from all three of them. Um, do you envision a day, well, for my daughter, where you know she can graduate high school in the ninth grade instead of <laughs> the twelfth grade? Uh, same thing from my college age son. Um, you know, could you could you ultimately shrink one? Uh, year of college uh, compared to normally the four. Um, what are some of the, you know, looking out, obviously, um, what, what are some of the other things you see sort of for the, uh, the general population and sort of the, once again, coming to this theme of sort of human enhancement um, that, you know, obviously not today, but maybe 20 years out, where, where is all this going? Because there really are, you know, you brought up, uh, you brought up uh, obviously the matrix. I, I think of the, uh, you know, Movies more from the 80s and the 90s, like The Lawnmower Man, where you know you took somebody that was extremely mentally challenged and gave them Einstein-like capabilities. Um, take us out a little bit uh, on, on a little bit of the the science future that you see here, beyond what you're currently doing. Yeah, so I think the future is about um, more symbiosis with technology. Um, like I alluded to before, there are cell phones. They've become already pretty much become a part of our bodies, at least for a lot of people. I know for me, I'm always on my phone. Um, but I think the future, um, you know, as technology advances, it'll be easier to pull out not only brain signals, maybe signals from the spinal cord, um, you know, biological signal, molecular signals. Um, I think the more, I think the future will be um, being able to pull more information from um, human beings and then pairing those up with this, you know, growing area of, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and, um, you know, um, just all these advanced algorithms and finding ways for those to work together. Um, you know, so I envision 
you know, our computer systems, or maybe it won't be a computer system, maybe it'll be a contact lens or, or something, you know, um, a little bit more advanced than your laptop that will change. It'll have a better understanding of what you need at, at a particular time or, um, you know, that could be emotional related. It could be, um, it could be not just learning, it could be more um, physical performance related, but um, I envision the future of these systems having a better sense of you, the human being, those being able to talk together more so and, and kind of change more organically for that individual. And especially as you bring in like autonomy, I still envision the human being being a part of that, but really um, maybe human being is more involved at, at high level decision-making. Um, and then the autonomy takes care of all the details. So maybe the future is, okay, I have the intent, I know what you want, or I can predict what you might do in the future. And then autonomous systems will um, take care of the rest um, based off of that, um, you know, down the line. Just some ideas I see coming down the line. And I think people are already working on that, right? Um, um, another application for a technology like this is also, we, we only talked about learning and, and training. Um, but brain computer interface or brain machine interface are also being used to control things, right? Uh, sure. Again, coming, going back to the clinical space, the, the kind of research that we were doing on using these uh, devices to control external devices, whether it's a wheelchair for uh, someone with paralysis or a computer cursor or, um, or, or their own limb. And um, now more and more research into uh, using the devices to enable people with, you know, someone who had a condition like a locked in syndrome to be able to communicate with their loved ones. Um, so yeah, so, so communicating with external devices and relaying your intent um, is, is another application. And I think that is not going away and it ties into what Nate was saying is a human machine symbiosis, right? We know Facebook, for example, is working on how can you control Facebook with your, with your brain, right? Mm -hmm. or, or with your brain signal. And, uh, and, and as researchers, um, again, obviously our goal is to develop technology for the war fighter um, with the hope that yes, there will be a broader application. Hopefully people in the researchers in the clinical space or people with disabilities will be able to take advantage of that. But beyond that, it's not really in our control what, what people do with this technology. And as every technology, it has the chances of getting into the wrong hand or being used in a, in a wrong way. Um, and again, this is not um, in our control, but, but what, what, what we do on our end is as we are developing these technologies, as we are thinking of applications, think very closely about the ethical, legal, and societal concerns of, you know, uh, or the implication uh, of this technology and be cognizant of that. Um, and, and so that we, we are, you know, we are part of that community where we are thinking very hard about, you know, um, you know the guidelines that need to be developed, the informed consent, you know, who can use this technology and when can they use that? They're all, all unanswered questions right now. But time is now to think about those, uh, those, those questions, those implications, and not 10 years from now when everyone else is using a technology. I think by the time it will be too late. But we need to address that. Um, um, but there, again, you, um, there are things that are in our control, things that are not in our control. People have been using method to improve performance for thousands of years. You think about meditation, you think about yoga, they were all these natural, organic methods. Yep. Um, I think neurotechnology will become one of these methods to improve performance, right? Can we get into meditative state faster because we got a boost, a neuromodulatory boost, which will you know, increase our performance? How can we control our phone but by just using our brain so that I don't even have to use my other hand to type anything? Um, again, different, different applications. Um, uh, but as a researcher here at Air Force, we are laser focus on what we want to deliver to, to the war fighter because a technology like that in a future war can be something that will make a difference between life and death. Um, and that's what we are focused on. But at the same time, cognizant of, you know, um, what are the other implications and how we should address those. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
you know, you know, typically when, when I when I do episodes like this that are on such the what I'll call the bleeding edge, I, I get a lot of emails afterwards from from young folks that are just you know starting off uh, their their academic career, and they you know they may say how do how what what should I do to get involved in this? Um, obviously, I'm talking to two experts in biomedical engineering and mechanical engineering. What are some of the uh, you know if someone comes up to you and say I want to do what you do? <laughs> um, what, what what do you what do you uh, suggest? Uh, are you looking for some specialists in in biotechnology and the artificial intelligence? What what should folks uh, the young folks that are going to be listening that are very interested in STEM? Uh, how should they be focusing their educational uh, interests early on to uh, to to join up with uh, Air Force Labs later on? Yes. Um, again, as I said in the very beginning, we are expanding. We are growing. Um, and, and growing in many ways, right? Um, um, I'm a big proponent of, you know, if you want to go fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far, you go together. So we want to work with the community, whether it's academic community, whether it's industry, you know, we want to work, we want to leverage what they have, but we also want to build our team. We, and as part of that, um, we have four open requisitions right now, I believe, Nate, or four or five. We are looking to add members to our team in the field of AI and machine learning with people with that kind of background, people with background in neuroscience, people with background in neuromodulation. Um, and it, it's across all levels, right? From interns to postdocs to full-time employees. Um, and, and, so it, and it's just not us. I think um, for young people to get involved, this is a very, very exciting time in neurotechnology. Earlier on, it was very, very clinical driven research and then academic, but now you look at what Elon Musk is doing with Neuralink or what Brian Johnson is doing with Kernel or what Facebook is doing with their new technologies. It's, it's, it's the critical mass is there. There is a momentum behind this field and the future is so bright, you know, with applications in clinic, with applications in, in, in DOD um, and with, in, in applications in consumer, in application in elite sport, right? How do we improve performance of these elite athletes? More and more elite athletes are using some form of neurotechnology to, to get that extra 200 milliseconds, which makes a difference between a podium finish and a second, you know, a gold medal or a silver medal. So many different applications um, of, of neurotechnology. Uh, and, and so I would say to the young people that unlike 20 years ago, where you have to really carve out a path for yourself, the field is open for you. You know, AFRL is one place where we are looking for talented young uh, investigators to join and um, help us advance our mission with a focus on, you know, doing something for our war fighters, you know, who put our, their lives at stake for us. But even beyond that, right, um, in industry, in academia, um, universities now have departments of neurotechnology uh, or neuroengineering department. That didn't exist 20 years back. Um, so, yeah, please get involved. Um, we need as many people as we can uh, in this community to help us advance our mission. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, final wrap-up question. We usually hand the, uh, the mic back to our guest. We uh, Obviously, you both have had fascinating careers so far, no doubt met many wonderful uh, mentors and influencers along the way in academia, in, in government, in the military. Um, anyone, to take your time, but uh, you, you can both take some time to just uh, mention uh, key influencers, uh, mentors, anyone you want to shout out to at this point that was very instrumental in, uh, in your development so far and keeping you on this particular intellectual path. Um, have the floor. Nick, you want to start? Nick, are you on mute? Nate dropped off for a second. I'll bring him back in. Here we go. There he is. Sorry about that. I guess my something happened to my internet. No problem. Did you catch that last question, Nate? I, I was just uh, passing the floor back to both of you just to, as a wrap up, uh, any important influencers and mentors that have helped to guide your career path so far that you might want to shout out to with the uh, the wrap up of the show. Um, the floor is yours. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh... I mean, there's a lot of folks. Uh, I mentioned I was in this student temporary employment programs, that program, 
where I was working at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. So I, um, you know, I had a boss, Mary Aponte, who, uh, you know, really gave me the opportunity to, to transition from uh, kind of the more administrative side of the base to kind of the foray into the science. Um, Andy McKinley had mentioned before, uh, was a big mentor for me, gave me the opportunity to get involved with um, neuromodulation research, which really exposed me to a lot of the things I mentioned earlier with, um, you know, kind of the more applied neuroscience side of things. Um, my academic advisor, Dr. Karen Moxon, uh, you know, kind of brought me to the foray of the brain machine interface um, realm and then some animal research and, and things on, on that end. Um, so those, those have been some big mentors that helped me get to, to where I am now. Sharma? Yeah, um, I guess I've been very fortunate to, to have met people um, in the last 20 years since I came here who, who have influenced, um, you know, and played a big role in what I am today and where I am in my, in my career. Um, you know, friends, family, mentors. I'll start with, you know, my, my PhD advisor, um, Professor Konstantinos Mevroides, um, who uh, um, passed away several years back because of brain tumor at a very young age. But he was, he was the first person who gave me that project and asked me to, do you want to do bio nano robotics? Uh, knowing very well that I don't know anything about biology, but he was willing to, to take a chance on me just because I did very well in his, in his class. Um, so from there, uh, uh, he had a huge impact on, you know, encouraging us and, and giving me the freedom to pursue uh, you know, my ideas, even in this new field, right? How can we use robotic principle to solve a protein confirmation problem? You know, uh, I proposed it to him and he said, yeah, fascinating, go out. And that, that became my, 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 my PhD thesis, right? Um, so, um, you know, uh, you know he, he had a huge role, obviously, in the beginning. Uh, my postdoc advisor, again, uh, someone who took a risk on me. I, I remember a, a very funny incident that happened with him when I was interviewing for the position in San Diego in this cancer research lab and my postdoc advisor, uh, Professor Jeff Smith, um, he called me and uh, he said that, you know, Gaurav, I would like to, to offer you this position, but you know, I'm taking a huge risk by doing that. And I thought, so am I, right? <laughs> I'm going from a mechanical engineer to being doing animal work and wouldn't experience, but, but, but again, he was willing to take a bet on me. Um, uh, it was a huge learning curve. And so what I've learned from these experiences um, uh, is, you know, we, we, we should be willing to take risk in our life. Because again, I believe, I, I don't know who said that, but that there's no bigger risk in life than to risk nothing. Um, I tried that all my career. I, I think that they paid off, but I was also fortunate uh, to work with people who were willing to take a risk on me. Um, and so, yeah, so these advisors and friends who were always there, um, uh, one last person, uh, Chad Bowden, again at Battelle, um, who, um, uh, who, who encouraged me and who gave me an opportunity to work on a neurotechnology program when, when Battelle was starting that, knowing very well that I had zero background in neurotechnology and look where I am right now, right? So it's because of these people who enabled me and um, who were willing to take a risk and saw what I brought to the table. I'm not an expert in neuroscience. I'm not even an expert in mechanical engineering because I don't have, I haven't done mechanical engineering in 20 years. What I think of myself is someone who understands a little bit of biology, someone who understands a little bit of engineering and have the aptitude to put them together to find a solution. And um, so for people to recognize what I brought to the table and, uh, and enabled me to do that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm always thankful to those people. And obviously my family, my, my wife, who, who encouraged me to go out and, um, and do a PhD, um, knowing very well that, you know, being an international student uh, on, on a temporary visa, uh, it can be challenging, right? We need to find a job first and, and secure a visa. Otherwise you can be out of status very soon. So, but yeah. These people uh, played a huge role in my development as, um, as an engineer in my career, but also in my life. And, and they are friends for life, right? I talk to them, uh, uh, my mentors all the time. And so I'm always thankful to them. And so 
so what my advice to young people again is be willing to take risk in your life and, and be willing to go out of your comfort zone and seek new knowledge and try out uh, different things because you will come out on the top even though it may be daunting in the beginning Excellent message. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, clearly the results of what you two are doing is just, uh, it, it gives a, uh, a perfect example of when you take these risks, uh, how you have the opportunity to create the future for all of us. So it's uh, really, really amazing stuff. Wishing you both the best with it. Um, 